Thank you, Councillor Hammond. Well, the 22nd International River Symposium is now open for business. And our first piece of business is our first keynote speaker, uh, Mara Boyne. Mara's career is both diverse and impressive. She was raised in Brazil, educated in the US, which she has called Australia home for the last 30 years. Her executive career has spanned finance, nonprofit, and consulting. For eight years, Mara was CEO of Green Cross Australia, uh, an NGO founded by Mikhail Gorbachev uh, and dedicated to climate resilience. She is currently president of the Australian Conservation Foundation, as well as a company director on the boards of Australian Ethical Investments and Anova Community Energy. She chairs the board of Gold Coast Waterways Authority, uh, an agency managing 160 kilometres of magnificent waterways just to our south. Uh, this morning, Mara's keynote is Love Change, How a Resilience Mindset Can Transform River Management. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Mara to the stage. So, uh, miraculously, I think we have about 45 minutes. Uh, can I pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land, um, acknowledge uh, their elders past, present and emerging, and uh, recognize just the pantheon of history on this incredible river city. I thought that was so moving, uh, the dance where, you know, the actual river is unearthed. Um, so, uh, sometime, I do believe I have a presentation here. And magically, it will emerge. Oh, oh, friends in the background. Is there actually a presentation? <laughs> it should, shouldn't it? Ah, <laughs> thank you so much. This is like the wisdom of of wisdom, um, I, I, you know, I, I really do have a very eclectic uh, background and I am not a researcher. And I'm gonna be saying some very daring things and I apologize in advance, but I just can't help but say them uh, because I do feel like research itself must be disrupted for us to actually have a chance at a prosperous century. <coughs> So this is the, uh, the presentation. I, I just wanted to disclose that although I am here wearing uh, the hat of being the most wonderful honor, the president of the Australian Conservation Foundation for our overseas guests, it's our oldest national environment nonprofit founded by Prince Philip in 1963 and uh, with over 600,000 members, millions of supporters. Uh, but I also wear various other hats, and I live at the nexus between uh, energy, water, capital, and climate. Uh, so Australian Ethical Investments is our fastest growing pension fund that is divested from fossil fuels and is achieving exceptional financial growth as well as, as impact. Um, Innova Community Energy is Australia's first community-owned energy retailer with a license across the national electricity market to bring decentralized distributed energy into our communities. Gold Coast Waterways Authorities, as, pa as Paul mentioned, is it's a, an exceptional story. I think the world's leading story on post-disaster betterment. In the late 1960s, we had some massive weather events and working with Delft, we created an entrance into what's called the Broadwater, stabilized it in a community of what were 50,000 people, we're now close to 600,000. And uh, all of that on the back of kind of engineering with nature, so a very, very interesting case study. And then the two consulting roles that I play, Food Agility is a cooperative research center that applies digital technologies to the future of food. And I lead strategy and development just as a consultant part-time. I'll weave some of the threads around exciting technology in this presentation. And finally, Simba Global, I also lead strategy for it's uh, the Southern Hemisphere's largest commercial linen company. And uh, boy, we're using data and RFID to track towels and sheets 
vast numbers of them, so that we can understand through analytics how to reduce unnecessary linen and all the embedded water through our supply chain, which is in India, Pakistan, China, and uh, Bangladesh. So all of those hats will come into play. Now today, we're going to start part one with the death spiral. And it's of our rivers, our ecosystems, and so much more. We're then going to talk about the pathway that goes beyond just recovery and into resilience. I'm going to throw a proposition that maybe, given the uncertainty in the world that we now live in, we need to plan a little bit less and experiment a little bit more. And then finally, if we want to unleash capital, we actually have to unleash data. So let's talk about how that works in terms of river resilience. So why resilience? When we talk about sustainable development, we really are talking about the well-being of communities and the ecosystems on which they depend. We're talking about that in the context of what the Rockefeller Foundation frames as the stresses and the shocks, the slow, ongoing change, and then the system shocks that can transform entire systems. And then we have to think about resilience for who? Because as we all know, we now live in a world where some very, very wealthy, primarily platform owners, are aggregating more wealth. And you know the rest of us are left out of that equation. So as we think about a resilient future, the cities, the rivers, the food that you know will sustain all of that, for whom? So talking about the death spiral, really, I, I, one of the things I was so grateful for the opportunity to, to give this talk is I actually did about half of the wonderful MOOC that the Stockholm Resilience Institute has up. It's absolutely wonderful. And I wanted to start with just we a sense of why. 8,000 years of civilizational evolution since the last ice age, essentially, we have linear and incremental impacts on the Earth system. Yes, we do expand agriculture, we do expand empires, we do start exploiting rare earth metals, but we have largely no indent on the Earth system as a whole. Mid-1950s, we embark on what is called the Great Acceleration. We go for exponential rise in pressures on essentially all the parameters that matter for human well-being and development exponential rise in pressures from loss of biodiversity, eutrophication, air pollution, deforestation, land degradation, so on and so forth. This is so large, in fact, this pressure, that science has now come to the conclusion that we've entered a whole new geological epoch. Can you imagine? We're leaving the Holocene, the stable interglacial state we've been in since the last ice age, when we have developed as a modern civilization on Earth, and we're now entering the Anthropocene. Anthros for us humans, we, humanity, are the dominating force of change on planet Earth. We exceed the natural drivers of change like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, and even our distance to the sun. We hold the future of our planet in our hands. Now you may think that that is like the most dramatic message, but it is not. Because you see, during this acceleration, the resilience of our planet has been extraordinary. In fact, we go into this exponential rise of pressures in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and we have so much biodiversity, we have so fantastic ability of the oceans and force to absorb and buffer our pressures that in fact we continue to deliver development with little invoices from the Earth system. It isn't until the mid-19, well, late 1980s, early 1990s that we get so much scientific evidence that we have reached a saturation point, where we start seeing tipping points being crossed and sudden, abrupt, and irreversible changes that start hurting our development. You see for the first time the collapse of the cod fisheries out of Newfoundland in the late 1980s. You see sudden collapse of lake systems from systems that can really deliver human well-being and ecosystem services to dead, murky, oxygen-free dead zones. You see the accelerated rise in, in melting of ice in the Arctic. You see, you start seeing the collapse of coral reef systems across the world. So from the 1990s onward, we've not only entered a whole new geological epoch, where we're the driving force number one, we've also reached a saturation point.
Oh, yay. It's all going to happen. So of course, um, that does frame where we are in this discussion. Here in Australia, of course, we, we have the Great Barrier Reef, uh, which is ours to care for. For decades, conservationists, people who love nature, fought long, hard battles to do things like protect drilling on the Great Barrier Reef, or create national parks, wetlands, marine parks. But uh, the challenge, of course, is with the impacts of this kind of development model that we have, and the impacts of climate change, those boundaries don't mean much anymore. And this report card on the Great Barrier Reef just greatly saddens me when we see bright red, and we're all aware of it because we see it on our televisions, we see it everywhere, but this really is our heritage. And when we think about 80% of the rivers across the Asia Pacific region being in poor condition, we, we realize you know, looking ahead at potentially three billion more people joining us is going to present challenges. And especially because, and you know, I had the privilege of leading the business development function for the CSIRO at the executive level for three and a half years. And um, in that period, of course, uh, it was when Jeff Carrot was the CEO and um, we were turning our minds to the grand flagships and challenges, and it was becoming clear that this climate trajectory was, was leading to dangerous places. And where it leads us now, under a business-as-usual scenario, we have to be quite clear because we're all very good at talking about two degrees. We've coached ourselves into talking about one and a half degrees, but we're heading for somewhere between three and four degrees. And according to the national academies in the US, and I thought I would honor them given how difficult it is these days to do climate science in America, what that means for rivers is five to 10% less stream flow for some rivers for every degree of increase. And then you begin to understand, according to the US academies, what it means for food production. It's hard to conceive of this world, right? You put yourself out there, and on the right hand side, we have the number of days of heat waves. And imagine that they go from sort of one and a half to three days more in a one degree future to what we're seeing. It 20 days. It is actually an unlivable planet that we are building for our kids, not to mention the rest of life. So as we think about this idea that not only do we need recovery, but given the tremendous pressure that's built into the system, we need to actually find ways to cope. And not just to cope, but to get hit by these shocks and come back even stronger. Right now, pollution and extinction are threatening the web of life. We're living with the consequences of bad decisions and short-term thinking. We don't accept the story that we must sacrifice nature for a quick buck. People made this crisis and we can solve it. We are the Australian Conservation Foundation. We can choose a brighter future. A world where we power our lives from the energy of the sun and the wind. Where strong laws protect the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the places we love. Where economic decisions support life and not damage it. A world where the idea of extinction is extinct. This is the future we can see. And this is the future we are creating. We are the Australian Conservation Foundation. We champion big ideas and common sense. When we work together, we can change anything. I am a high school student and I'm fighting for the reef. 
I'm a community organiser and I'm making a difference in the arid lands of Central Australia. I'm an artist and a writer and I'm trying to educate people through my work. I'm a fisherman and I love the Kuro. I'm a future leader and I believe in the power of people to make a difference. I'm a parent and I care about the future and I want to be a part of the solution. I'm a traditional owner whose people have cared for this country for thousands of years and still do. We are a strong and growing community. We show up, speak out and act. For a world where forests, rivers, people and wildlife can thrive. I love this island. I love the smell of eucalyptus on a hot day. I love the colours of the desert country. And I love the sea that kisses the shores. We hold this world in trust. For the future, for all life. We are the Australian Conservation Foundation. Proudly independent. And funded by donations. From everyday Australians. Together, we know how to create the world that we want. Join us and let's get on with it. So, the story on resilience starts with the story of change that the Australian Conservation Foundation has been going through over recent years and decades. As I mentioned, we have this heritage of, you know, our forebears having created these magnificent parts of our national estate, but then with warming and uh, other drivers of uh, extinction, all of that feels like, gee, we have to actually begin by changing the story. So our theory of change starts there, because we have to imagine something different to actually create it. And then we have to work at the system level, because there's no point in saving something that is going to be undermined. And the four systems that we're working on, climate damage, and clearly that relates to uh, both electricity and we are about to enter uh, food production and agriculture and I'll tell you some exciting ideas about that. We absolutely stand up for nature. This country has some of the weakest and least infor enforced environmental laws. We are constantly having to go to court to prove really basic things that are not being done on behalf of nature. We have concerns about the governance in Australia, our democracy and the fact that it's possible for coal magnets to just write very large checks and run many, many TV ads right into our elections and swing votes. Uh, we have you know, a real intention to support transformation of the economy because we do think it is possible to have an economy that's good for us and good for nature and also is prosperous. And so that is our, our great aim. And so we're turning our minds now to resilience thinking Oh, there are geniuses here that help with these presentations, and I think this one is all set up again from the Stockholm Resilience Institute MOOC, and some of you may recognize. If we work in a space that has very low control and very low certainty, we call that complex, and this is where the idea of complexity comes in. In this domain, we really have very little control. We really can't make the change we'd like to make, and we're not really sure what's the best thing to do. And this is where a lot of development practice takes place. So here, cause and effect's not really discernible. We really don't know what the linkages are between the different variables. And there's lots of different things happening and changing in the system, and so it's quite unpredictable. So here, technical or expert knowledge is really of limited use. We need to match that or bring it together with local knowledge about how the system works. And so it's important to engage deeply with people in the system about what they know about their place and how it works. We often need to develop really unique interventions uh, what works somewhere else won't necessarily work here. And so we need ways to develop new approaches and ways to innovate in a particular place. And we need ways to implement and test those different innovations and refine what works for this place and tailoring it to these particular dynamics. So in this case, think about a river basin where a whole, that crosses a range of boundaries, where a whole range of people and users, uh, people in towns and villages, as well as farmers, there's all sorts of different things that can move through the system like pollution or floods, etc. And it's a very complex space with lots of uncertainty. In which the impacts of an event are actually stronger far away in time and space from where that event occurs. And this might sound really bizarre. 
and in some ways it is, but it's actually reality. A classic example of this kind of, of, of dynamic is the situation of people in the Arctic. So people living in the Arctic who are far away from industrial civilization have some of the highest concentrations of heavy metals and other types of persistent organic pollutants in their blood because atmospheric uh, transport of pollution from the industrial world goes into the Arctic where it is moves up through the food chain and where these people eat lots of meat end up with very high levels of or, uh, inorganic contaminants in their body. So dealing with this problem doesn't require looking locally. It requires looking away somewhere that's far away, both in time and space. So you can begin to appreciate the, the, the challenges of thinking about a resilience mindset when the complex adaptive systems involved are so interconnected and so uh, multi-layered that you, you actually don't know the effect of doing something here over there. Now, uh, I was very fortunate when leading Green Cross Australia to partner with the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities program uh, in Melbourne as well as in Sydney. And so the Rockefeller lens on, on urban resilience has always stayed strongly uh, you know, in the back of my mind. And it's this idea that we have to actually address the underlying stresses within our systems so that when the shocks hit them, they can self-organize and self-correct in a positive direction. And that's kind of the secret of it, because if you invest before, it's that old thing about adaptation, the returns are much higher than if you wait until you're hit. Challenge is, when you look at those shocks and stresses, and this again is from the Stockholm Resilience Institute, it's very tempting to look at just the events that we see. But underneath those events, the layers of complexity that we have to address as researchers and really kind of understand the, 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 the interrelationships and coming back to the systems level of thinking underneath it all, when we talk about mental models, values, these worldviews, um, I grapple a lot with this, this sense that there's some people who see this lens of sort of me and you know the the individual and i completely respect and understand that and how do you then appeal to that worldview at the same time as those that see more of the dependency and the us in the equation and how that flows through to politics at all levels local global etc so these are the challenges of of understanding the shift to resilience now I do encourage you to do the MOOC if this community of practice is really serious about you know, that mindset shift. Um, there's a wonderful 15 minute episode where they talk about the seven key stages. And the first is to understand that um, when a system is shocked, it, it, if different aspects of it can kick into gear, if there's redundancy built in, then it has a very, very different chance. And that's as much about uh, multiple species as it is about the governance of a river system and embedding different layers of community government business. The connectivity that happens particularly as we lead into and come out of shocks is really critical and some of that of course is around our communication networks but it's also about knowing our neighbors. Um, you can go too far on all of these things. You can be so connected that there's no more diversity in the system. So it's all bound with really interesting systems thinking. Um, and then this idea that the creeping variables that we're measuring can, and I'm thinking back to where we are on the climate issue and why we really must reverse the course. At some stage, the system just can't kind of cope and stay within itself. It actually shifts into what, you know, uh, the term is a regime change. And we don't quite know what that looks like. You know, the world has had very, very high seas, and there were times when you can walk across the Aleutian Islands, you know, from, from Russia to Alaska. So we've seen so much variability. It's just that that kind of abrupt regime change could happen at timescales which are very different uh, with, you know, many people involved. 
So the last four elements are really about the governance models themselves. And this idea of understanding within these adaptive complex systems, those of us that have engineering backgrounds, those of us that you know, are very, very good at long-term planning, we have this kind of linear you know, way of understanding can define model, but challenge is nonlinear thinking becomes really critical. Learning and experimentation is going to save the world. <laughs> And unless we can all become like Silicon Valley and really understand how to do that well, I just don't see how we're going to get there. This idea of participation, and it doesn't matter what kind of political system we have, whether it's a Western democracy or other models of growth, the idea of participation across different actors within our spatial you know, settings, our natural ecosystems, is going to be absolutely critical. And this, this agency that we have to be prepared to give them is, is really critical. Um, you know, after a major event, no one comes, sometimes for up to seven days. And so who is left is who is there. And we must have agency. So we have to find these, these models of engagement that allow for that. So I was learning a little bit about the uh, IWRM framework because, um, of course, it's been guiding so much of your discipline for so many decades. And this UN definition creates a sense of collaboration, coordination, which is very powerful. Um, I like this idea that you, know, you do an assessment, you think about strategy, you implement a plan, but that's where I got lost because the challenge these days is planning presupposes a whole lot of knowledge, which in this age of uncertainty we just don't have. So let's talk about that. How does a world with less planning and more experimentation actually look? And you have to forgive me because you know I spent five years at Morgan Stanley, which is one of the world's biggest investment banks in Silicon Valley. I was a technology banker. And I also led equities research at Macquarie Bank during the dot-com boom, right? So in addition to having this big genetic predisposition towards nature, you know, the technology uh, driver within me is very strong because I've experienced what the entrepreneurs go through in order to create these very large global change machines that are these digital platforms. And so I draw a lot from their learning. Think about planning in the context of a huge amount of uncertainty, right, when you start, and very little information, because you're learning as you go. So you have this very, very big gap. And if you're thinking about a five-year plan and how to actually implement that up front, it's really challenging unless you're prepared to start experimenting as part of that plan. And that experimentation, this framework, by the way, came out of the UNHCR. And you can imagine the, deal of the, the great deal of uncertainty that they confront. But increasingly, in uh, the world that I work in, this idea that our plans must begin with experiments is gaining traction. And so then the question, I can't believe I'm asking this to a room like you. <laughs> but I am. How do we experiment? like literally, in this world where they say we have 10 years to correct this course. Please don't tell me you're going to take five years to just gather the data, right? Because we have to really move at a different pace. Six simple steps on how to experiment. You can Google a million of them, and you're a professional researcher, so of course you know. But the first one is to be very clear about your purpose. Fall in love with your problem. Don't think you know what the problem is until you actually get the beneficiaries of your solution in the room. Don't think your perspective is guiding that problem definition when four or five other disciplines or perspectives actually would pivot where you focus completely. Really, really critical. Be deliberate about listing your assumptions. We make so many of them, but when we experiment, with this planet in this short decade, we have to be really clear about what we're assuming. And then list 
which are the highest risk assumptions? Whatever innovation you're coming up with, if no one uses it, it's a pretty high assumption, right? We have to really be clear about where the risk is in our experimentation. Then start to design what you do. Keep it simple. Make it in the real world. People have to be involved. Collect the data. And in the beginning, it doesn't matter how you collect it. Just be driven by data. And then think about where you pivot. So this is a great big, huge screen that you definitely shouldn't read. <laughs> but this is one of the tools that we use at Food Agility. And it's also a very common tool at any startup incubator. The difference is that we're applying it to research. Very, very different mindset. So this is called the Lean Canvas. Very well tried, tested, deliberate model of innovation. And it forces you to be very clear. This particular one is actually a real one. Uh, we have a hypothesis at Food Agility that if we had a data exchange where data sets, especially if they're streaming data, could be collected with collaboration from producers, from farmers, then it would be possible for our marvelous data scientists to create algorithms that can then be used by a very large, important, nascent class of ag tech startups who will place tools in the hands of farmers that actually can help us get to the resilience we need to be. But there's a whole bunch of stuff embedded in our assumptions and hypotheses. And just to give you an example, I think the number one high risk assumption is, will farmers trust their data to our appointed data collection agency, which in this case is Food Agility. It's a cooperative research center with seven universities, 25 corporate members. How are we testing that? We're doing something very fun in a couple of weeks. It's called the train hack. We literally got together with UNE and organized for a bunch of farmers to join a train at Central Station with a bunch of data analysts and go on a slow train ride back to the university and in 48 hours to actually begin to develop small algorithms on the data that's shared to address specific problems they can chat about on the train. What's that going to teach us? It's going to teach us a whole lot about who's willing to share, what kind, what format. This is an example of um, what we call a future cast back cast. So we like to think massively, right? In this, and again, this is from Pollinizer, which was Australia's leading um, incubator. Uh, the founder of Pollinizer, Phil Morrill, is a director on the board of Food Agility and also is with Main Sequence Ventures, which is a CSIRO uh, investment venture fund. And so we use a lot of shared tools. These are all very, very freely available. This is one where you imagine this massive thing that you're trying to do, and then you figure out what's the very first step that you take. Often it's called a skateboard. You might have heard about that when you hear about agile development and what are called minimum viable products. So the idea is trying to develop a car, but you don't do it by like taking five years building a car. You start with a skateboard and learn about the movement and then from a skateboard, maybe a bicycle and then a motorcycle and then, and gradually you're getting market feedback and you're actually in the market getting feedback from people that are using these products and services. Now, Here's very interesting, we call it sandals because we actually use this framework. A team of us were, had an incredible experience a couple of months ago. We went to Addis Ababa, uh, hosted by ULRI, the International Livestock Research Agency, of course, part of the great CGIAR system, and uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Because a lot of the world's big donors that have the same appetite for experimentation that I'm sharing with you here today are now asking it of the innovation system that we created many decades ago because they need to see that impact grow. So in this case, the massive was getting to Kilimanjaro. And you know you're gonna end up, you know, the last sort of 500 miles are gonna be by car, but you start by walking and you need sandals. And we literally had four rooms of 60 people together that included everyone from CEOs of major global genetics companies many researchers, many local value chain players, and we brought smallholder farmers literally into the middle of the room and we interviewed them. What matters to you? 
because built like that first Stockholm Resilience video, we can do everything in the world to reduce the methane in our own livestock system, but unless we can make livestock more productive in Africa, our farmers are not going to be able to, you know, get through. So there you go. Um, these tools are all available, but how do we unleash the capital that is required for this to happen? Now, this was just an incredible thing that I got to sit for five minutes. So this was an incredible thing. Ross Garno gave the keynote this year at the Crawford Fund event, and he painted a picture which ends up like this. Our strength in growing and using biomass will set Australia up as the superpower of the low carbon world economy. That's the opportunity that we confront. We have to get the marginal cost of measuring natural capital down to zero. We have to do that through the satellites, through the drones, through the sensors. We've got to use data analytics to begin to predict what that data is telling us. And we have to pull together the ability to not just do report cards, but to have flowing data that gives us a transparent view on what is happening to the nature that is going to keep us safe. The ag tech revolution that's powering this right now, it is a massive growth of venture investment in California, Massachusetts, Israel. You watch what will happen, and we have a very healthy uh, ag tech universe. You can look at the ag tech finder, which is another food agility initiative, to find 250 Australian startups that are helping to build this new world. Right now, artificial intelligence helps us meet the needs of today so we're prepared for tomorrow. By 2050, we need to produce 60% more food. So how are we going to feed the world without wrecking the planet? Using Microsoft artificial intelligence, we can reduce waste and produce more food. Any grower will tell you every row, every crop is different. We can use Microsoft AI to make local predictions about light, wind, rain. This helps farmers know when to plant, irrigate, and harvest. It's making a difference. Artificial intelligence helps farmers grow more while wasting less. Roz Harvey, the founder of AgTech Startup The Yield, is also a director on the board of the Australian Conservation Foundation. She is helping us to turn our minds to how we double the value of food production in this country while having the impact. That includes land. At the institutional level, it is because APRA and reserve banks around the world are demanding that major corporations manage climate risk that we now have a chance, regardless of what our political parties decide. And Mercer, our biggest financial advisor, tells us every investment we make going forward as institutional investors must be in that sweet spot that integrates adaptation and mitigation. The Queensland government's land restoration fund is exactly that. And I'll end by just asking you to reflect. We are sitting on a great big giant carbon sink. And the future of regenerating that actually is the future of replenishing our regional communities. And as Ross Garno says, they will be the drivers of the superpower that Australia can become. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mara. There will be a, a recording of Mara's talk available on on, some, on the social network associated with the, the, the symposium and, uh, quite shortly. And Mara will be in the River Foundation booth during morning tea if you have any questions. On behalf of, of the audience, I'd like to present you with a small gift. Thank you very much for a stimulating and provocative talk to get us going.